Hello and welcome to episode 32 of Teach Tech Play. I'm Eleni Karitzis and I'm the founder and host of Teach Tech Play. Today we've got a fantastic show with some educators from the US and Australia. So I'm really excited to have them join us today and I know it was great fun last month. We didn't have a show but we were at ISTE in San Antonio in America presenting all about Teach Tech Play. But before I get to that, Steve, and to say hello to you, I need to congratulate you first. So um, over the break, the month that we had off, Steve got accepted into the Apple Distinguished Educator Program and is now an Apple Distinguished Educator. So well done, Steve. Thank you very um, much. So Steve, do you want to say hello to everyone? Hello, everybody. It's a beautiful Sunday morning and it's freezing. Uh, and Eleni, the last time we caught up, we it was about 35 degrees and we were in San Antonio. So this is a little bit of a, a bit of a shock to the system, but we've got an awesome light up today. And once again, I get to sit and enjoy some unbelievable professional development from the comfort of my seat here. So I'm looking forward to today's episode. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. And yes, I must say, uh, Melbourne weather now is not quite nice with our 110 kilometre winds outside. So um, it's quite nice to be inside, but I do wish we were in sunny San Antonio. And um, when we were in ISTE, I'll just share my screen quickly because we did launch our new conference. Actually, I'll come to that in a second. Um, but we also need to congratulate before I get started, our episode 31 winner, which was Trent Ray, and he shared with us Make Do. So um, thanks Trent for sharing that. I know having Trent on the show is always great and he has wonderful things to share. If you are following or have any questions, make sure you do use the Teach Tech Play hashtag, which is hashtag TT Play. Um, but I'm going to jump over to our presenters to say hello and introduce themselves for today's show. So from America, we've got Christine Pinto. Do you want to say hello to everyone? Yes. Hi, my name is Christine Pinto and I teach kindergarten in California. Uh, I've been teaching about a year and a half and I'm the founder of the hashtag GAF for Littles, which is um, G-A-F-E, the number four, and Littles. And on that hashtag, a lot of teachers share um, how, they're, how, how they are integrating technology with their students. So that's me. Perfect. Thank you. And I had the pleasure of meeting you at ISTE. So it was great to get you on the show because I know you're doing some fantastic things. Next we've, got, next, we've got Matt from Canberra, who I had the privilege of meeting at last year's Teach Tech Play conference. So, Matt, let us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and where you're from. Hey, guys, I'm Matt Aquilina. I'm here in sunny but freezing cold Canberra. Um, been teaching for five years now, uh, mostly on year six, but just so excited and overwhelmed with all the cool stuff that's going on. So, I'm just trying to simplify it for others, but especially myself as well. So. Really pumped to be here, thank you. Perfect, thank you, Matt. Um, then we've got Kathy, and I had the privilege of listening to Kathy's Ignite talk at ISTE and blew me away, so I knew we had to get her on the show. So Kathy, um, introduce yourself, I won't say too much, and tell us where you're from. Hi there, guys. Thanks so much for having me. It's always really exciting to talk about these um, really important things, and, and I think they are really important things. I, I'm a teacher um, who, who works across the curriculum, but um, very much a visual arts educator at heart, um, and I love really sharing the positive stories of success that students are having with um, arts learning experiences um, across year levels. So um, really looking forward to doing that today and hearing your spins on the, the things that I've got to say and then getting to uh, feedback from your inspirational material today too, guys. So thanks again for having me. No problem, Kathy. Thank you. And then last but not least, we have got Casey Bell, who I'm excited to say is our opening keynote for the 2018 Teach Tech Play Conference. So welcome, Casey. We're glad to have you and we can't wait to have you out in Australia, Australia either next year. I am super excited to be here today. Um, hey, y'all. I have to say the hey, y'all. So um, I am coming to you from Texas. It's late Saturday afternoon, but I am very excited to be on the web show today, as well as the opportunity to um, come and, and present at the Teach Tech Play conference. So it's truly an honor to be here. I am a digital learning consultant in, in Texas, but I am also a blogger at Shake Up Learning and have a podcast with my buddy, Matt Miller, who I know has also been on the show. So um, I'm just excited to be here. So thank you so much. 
Perfect, thank you, Casey. Now I'm just gonna share my screen so everybody can just grab the link to see um, our web show. So make sure you do check out our website. Um, you can just go to teachtechplay.com forward slash web show for all the details of today's show and also the most critical thing to vote for your favorite presenter. And as we had said, we have got the 2018 Teach Tech Play Conference. It will be at Ivanhoe Grammar again. Thank you, Steve and Ivanhoe for hosting. And our keynotes for next year, we have Casey Bell, Tom Barrett and Emily McLean. So make sure you do check that out and get your tickets because we know last year we did sell out and hopefully we can do again next year. So it is quite a fair way away being um, in April next year, but Get in early, make sure you put it in for PD for next year. Alrighty, we're going to get kickstart with the show. And first we have Christine up and she'll be sharing with us Little Ears Create Phonic Collages with Google Slides. So let me know when you're ready and I can start the timer. Okay, Deb, yeah. I have a timer on my end too, so I don't go over. All right, so I'm ready to go. Let's see, screen share. I probably should have done that first. Wow, can you see my screen? Yep, perfect. Sweet. Okay, can you still see it? Yep, perfect. Okay, hopefully things don't get cut off on the side. But anyway, so um, I'm all about integrating Google Apps with my little kids. I mentioned earlier I teach kindergartners, so uh, if you're interested in catching my slides, I put a bit.ly there. And um, also the template that is for this specific activity is christinepinto.com slash phonics collages. So uh, I, these first couple of slides are just samples that I took from my kids. So in kindergarten, at the beginning of the year, the kids are learning um, to identify letters and that sounds go with letters. And this activity is something that my kids did at the end of the year when we started talking about like digraphs and blends, which is um, when you pretty much put like two like letter sounds together. So like this is a digraph, the ch, the ch is ch. And so um, how this worked in my classroom was um, we would brainstorm words that we heard the ch sound. And so I, I would draw like a, I would try to draw like my wannabe, like, you know, a cheetah on there and I would write out the word. And so the, so then the kids went and they started to um, do image searches within Google Slides uh, for the, like, you know, pictures that went with the phonics pattern. So this one is an example of, of the sh, the sh, um, and they were inspired by um, Heidi songs. I don't know if the, uh, if our listeners know who Heidi Songs is, uh, she's, I actually used to work with Heidi Songs. Uh, we were at the same school, but um, she has a lot of great resources to help the kids um, remember like uh, sight words and um, you know, sounds that go with the alphabet and everything. So I have a video here that you can click on to listen to, but the little picture that's over here in the corner, that is like, that was on the slide. The whole, the other pictures down here, along with the, words that those like the kids inserted those pictures and they typed those words so um and this was like an ongoing project so one day we would focus on you know cha and then another day we would focus on the sh and so forth so that's that um so again the idea is that the kids are inserting an image and the nice thing about google slides is that you can or you, any of the google apps is that you can do an image search within the app. So that means all it takes is it's what this GIF is doing. You click on the mountain picture, they type in the word, they click on the blue magnifying glass, and then they get to select the picture they want and they insert it. So um, that's something that they're totally capable of doing. Um, so what I like about this activity is that the kids are making choices. They're deciding which words they want to search and which pictures that they want to include. But there's like uh, other like elements to this where it's kind of like I had a kiddo who searched the word bath when we were talking about the th and um he's like I, I can't I can't find the bathtub that I want and I was like well sometimes that's gonna happen you're gonna be given results and you have to figure out how can I fix my search so that you can get the pictures that you want so it takes some brainstorming and some thinking on that end um, one minute Okay, cool. So I'm going to play a quick video. I don't know if the audio is going to work on here, uh, but this is what it looked like in action with the kiddos. Oh, it's true. It's in the green room. Oh, 
Okay, so this was my kiddo, um, and he was just super excited to, to search Pikachu. I think that's my time, so I'm going to stop. So that's me. <laughs> Fabric, I have 10 seconds left, but well done. Thank you. All right, so stop sharing. Wonderful. And I think what you were sharing there is really exciting to show that no matter what age you teach, you can use technology. And I think a lot of people, especially teaching littlies, get that, get scared. I know I was talking to one of my prep teachers, which is the first year of school here. So they are five-year-olds. And she was saying, I could not teach an older grade because I just have no idea how to use the technology in the classroom. I said, well, aren't you using it with the press? And she's gone, not much, just a few little things here and there. And I think what you're doing is absolutely great to show that they are capable and we just have to give them the opportunities to do so. Did anybody else have any questions for Christine? I do. Uh, Christine, what I love about what you've done is you've taken literacy and you've baked in digital technologies. So when the first time that it happened, when like that bath and bathtub, was that then a targeted lesson where you talked about being specific with your searches or was it something that you did a one-on-one -on -one with your students? Um, it was something that I addressed in the moment with that student and then um, w because the kids were all working it was something that I mentioned the next time that they were working on the activity so as I mentioned this activity was kind of like a work in progress we would work on it would work on a slide at a time like one slide a day and so the next time I had that they were going to work on a new slide then I we talked about like, the conversation I had with that one kiddo about like okay, so some, you know, that whole thing, like sometimes the computer is going to give you results and you have to be smarter than the computer and, and, and think, how am I going to fix it? Because the computer doesn't know exactly what you want. And so, um, yeah, so like a mini little lesson came out of that. Also the whole thing of, um, you know, if, cause one of our words was cute or one of the, the searches was cute. And I think the kiddo was hoping to find, I forgot what he wanted to find, but like, we go, we have these talks of like, if you wanted to have a picture of a kite or something cute, like, you know, if you want to have a picture of a kite, we were, oh, that was what it was. It was like the bossy E words. So, um, where, uh, the E makes the vowel say its name. So like kite, but he, like, you know, he's like, why did a picture of a banana come up? And I'm like, well, I don't know. You have to think though. You have to put like, do you, is that a picture of a kite? No. So you have to think like, I'm not going to insert that picture. So yeah. Beautiful. Perfect. Thank you. Next up, we have got Matt, who will be sharing with us futuristic teaching in a realistic classroom. So let me know when you're ready, Matt, and I'll start the timer. Okay, I'm good to go. Off you go. Thanks so much for having me, guys. I'll get straight in. So this journey sort of all started when I came back from Teach Tech Play uh, in 2016, and we just had this huge overflow of information, and we were so excited, and then we were so terrified at the same time. So. I started having a conversation with my staff and was showing them photos and all these teachers could look at was, look at the furniture, look at the rooms, look how cool their spaces are. And I'm like, yeah, that stuff's really cool, but you needed to hear what these people had to say. And they started freaking out about their own spaces and what do I have? What don't I have? Can we buy this furniture? Oh, I can't do that with my room. And it was just getting really, really crazy and overwhelming for them. So what I started to focus on in my own room is how I can take the kids outside of the classroom in a mental space without having all of this fancy furniture, all of this amazing tech. So in my year six classroom here, we have um, our devices, we have one-to-one. -one. Um, but as you can see, my room is, you know, it's fairly standard. It's a fairly standard classroom. It's a fairly sort of standard um, school. So we started looking into all of the cool things we could do. Mystery Skype was one of the first things that I introduced for our year six classes, which completely blew them away. So it was that idea of taking them outside of the classroom and showing them that there's a really big world out there. So um, the idea of Mystery Skype being that they locate um, a school that can be anywhere in the world, whoever we connect with, um, asking questions and then guiding the students into um, you know, ways that they can ask questions and, and ways that they can use their devices. So. What we've tried to do here at my school is really think outside the box without having to, um, like I said, purchase all of this amazing furniture or have all of these amazing spaces. Um, if I can share with you quickly how we've taken it um, to our teams is with something like a planner, this is sort of our standard literacy planner here. And you can see on the side, hopefully how that we've made um, some comments to each other while we're planning. So using Google Docs, you're able to comment um, with people and um, 
have discussions with them in real time. So this is a comment that I've made for my, um, my other teachers that I'm teaching with. And if I go to um, one of the other Google Docs here, this is with one of my students, um, I'm able to comment on their work while they're working on it. So they can see the comment straight away and I give them feedback instantly. One thing that, um, if I just stop the share there, one thing that's been really important for my year sixes um, and a culture that I'm trying to create on our team is that it's okay to fail. We're trying to encourage failure in the students. We want them to fail. We want them to see that they make mistakes because when they make that mistake, that's where the learning and the growth happens. If they're too scared to fiddle with an app because they're worried they're gonna get it wrong, they're never gonna master that app. So it's something that we're really trying to encourage. But the tricky thing is, is that we wanna plan when they fail, how they fail, and then we wanna plan the reaction when the students do fail. So it's something that's really becoming um, a cultural thing here in year six at my school. That we want them to go. Thanks. We want them to go and work out something on their own. We want them to make mistakes. We want them to play with that app and get frustrated with it. And then where that frustration and that failure happens, we want them to fall forward because that's where the best learning happens. So that's, I guess, why I'm calling it um, sort of futuristic teaching in a realistic classroom. That we're doing amazing things here with GAF, with Mystery Skype, um, and, and we're just doing it in a sort of uh, everyday setting, just like so many of you are. So it's something I'm really excited about. Perfect. You had 20 seconds to spare, Matt. Well done. Ooh. And I think what you were saying there is really critical. I know going from year six, obviously teaching year six for three years and now teaching year three, I've even noticed that sense of year threes are so much more willing to just have a go. And, you know, year sixes are so scared to get it wrong. And it makes me think, what are we doing in our schools that are, you know, limiting those students to say something that may not be right or to ask something that we don't know the answer to? I think that, you know, there are a lot of tools and it doesn't matter what your actual space looks like. You, as teachers, we're flexible. We work with what we've got. but it's how we provide opportunities for them to see and learn from that. So thank you for sharing. Did anyone else have anything they wanted to comment on or ask? Yeah, Matt, okay. what I love is that your takeaways from Teach Tech Play weren't to go out and buy stuff because there's so much that you can do in your classroom just by moving the furniture around, just by having clever conversations. So. Uh, kudos to you for, for being brave and just say, how do we actually make this sustainable um, and cultural? Because that's going to have a lot more impact in the future than just simply shelling out money on furniture. So well done. Yeah, and I think it's important to know that the students don't the students don't notice the difference in price in furniture. I mean, we you know we jumped we jumped on Gumtree, you know we went to Kmart, and you know we've got we've got spaces here. Yeah, we've got traditional desks, but then we've got bean bags, we've got tables that they can sit on the floor, all those sorts of things. So um, the students don't care; they just want it to be different, and they want it you know to be a cool space for them to learn in. So yeah, thanks so much. Well done. And what resonated with me was the um, terrified slash excited, which I think is a really interesting um, operational status. And, and, and I think beautiful things happen at that intersection. And the key is having the support to go ahead and to be that risk taker, which obviously you found in the community there for yourself. And now you're bringing that to others. So that's a beautiful thing. And I think in our schools, if there's always that common crazy person, you know, that, um, that will share discussions with you, that will move furniture around during that lesson when you should have been something else. And we're like, no, we're moving our furniture. Let's go and do it. So find that sort of co-crazy person and, and go and experiment and have fun. And interestingly, I think then instead of being the crazy ones and the, the co-crazy people, it just normalises. And, and, and I guess that's really what we want, isn't it? That the cultural shift happens um, and you're seeing that in action. So congratulations on that, Matt. Thanks so much. Thanks a lot, guys. Perfect. Thank you, Matt. Next up is me. So I am going to start my timer and then flick over to what I'm sharing. Alrighty. So what I'm going to be sharing today is BeeBots. Now, a lot of people do know or have seen BeeBots before. Um, these are these little um, robots. You turn them on, they make little sounds, they're directional movements, so, you know, move and then go, so it will move two spots forward, and I'm just going to stop it because it's going to keep making that noise and annoy me. 
But BeeBots are primarily used in the junior classroom. So from our, we use it from our three-year-olds mainly to our year ones. But I was doing something with my year threes and I went to our um, e-learning coach and I said, I want to borrow the BeeBots. And he said, uh, you're in year three, you don't really need to use them. I said, no, 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 I'm not worrying about the actual BeeBot. It's something else we're doing in maths. So he was a bit shocked going, why on earth do you want to use them in your classroom? So I took them and what I did was, I'm just going to share with you my slides. What I did was I created questions. So I used all the BeeBot maths that we already had and I simply put on, we're looking at math, in maths location. So I put on the coordinates. I just mask and tape them onto the maths. And I created challenge cards. So here you could see start the B-Bot at E1, enter the following code, press go. What's the coordinate of the B-Bot? So this was something that I wanted to work with my students to get them to manipulate objects and to find things. I found that with location, sometimes it gets hard when you're trying to develop those mapping skills without giving them worksheets and if anybody knows me I'm all for against worksheets they're like something I do not like so I wanted to think of something that is tactile and students can learn through exploration so this was simply one we had a map of Australia and they went around and moved and the questions got harder as they progressed through the students worked together to solve these problems and to then they scanned the QR code on their iPad to find out whether they were correct or incorrect. And if they were incorrect, then the discussion and the conversation that came out from the students was really exciting because they were like, well, where do we go wrong? That, that, no, we are right, the thing's wrong. And it's amazing how many times they come to me and say, Miss Kay, you got it wrong. And I'm like, are you sure I got it wrong? Let's have a look at it together. They always love to prove when we make mistakes and get things wrong. Um, but then we talked it through and they could work out what I was meaning. You know, we threw in language like turn 90 degrees clockwise and anti-clockwise. We found out that our students weren't aware of this language at a pre-assessment we did at the start of the year. So we knew we had to talk a lot more about that. We haven't even looked at angles yet, but they remembered from the year before about 90 degrees and then looking at the clock, which way is clockwise, which way is anti-clockwise. So all of this directional um, language came through through this activity so we also went on and obviously I just worked with the maps that we had so I had to make up little problems they weren't all um, compass related either the map of Australia, Australia was really good because it did have a compass so I could say turn east turn west where some of the others like this shape map I couldn't do that but then the next step, what we did was I took the students one step further and we had student-led conferences coming up, which is where we have parents come in and students share their learning, which is quite exciting because we don't have to do all the talking mid-year and the report goes out, the kids do it. So they created a plan and then they upscaled it onto a big A. I've got to remember my paper sizes now. Anyway, big poster paper for the B-Bot to move. And in doing that, they had a key, they had the compass, and it was amazing to see the parents working with the students. And I had one parent tell me that the students were wrong because the B-Bot was facing south and it said the B-Bot then turned east. And so she turned the B-Bot west. And I've gone, well, the compass never moves. And the parent ended up trying... Oh, there's my timer. But the parent couldn't work out why. And it was just exciting to see how the um, students and um, worked with the parents to get it done. So I think I've stopped screen sharing now. I hope so. Yeah, perfect. So yeah, that was just something fun and exciting. And then obviously our e-learning coach then asked me to share it with everyone to share how Technology isn't just for the juniors using BeeBots. They can be created in the upper grades too. So um, use the technology you've got. It doesn't have to be specific to, obviously, coding came into it, but it wasn't the target of my lesson. So um, that was a rush, but I got through it. Did anyone have any questions? <laughs> Lenny, as somebody who whose responsibility is to purchase gear, it's really good to see people actually step outside what's prescribed in terms of it's a bebop it's just for prep to, to just do you know direction this so to actually have somebody think and apply in a different context actually means that your investment can go much much further if you you know throw a little bit of crazy in there and try it out so well done yeah and our year sixes are now using it for cartesian planes as well so taking it 
one step further. So yeah, that's something I'm really big on, especially when schools make purchases, um, use them across year levels, don't just limit them. So yeah, any other I, questions? I loved it. Thank you for sharing that. I thought that was, and, and I, I'm a big proponent of finding alternative ways to use the ways that we think traditional tools or whatever the tool's designed for. And I'm also always trying to tell, I came from the secondary world. I taught middle school, but when I moved into to sort of the coaching position, trying to tell high school teachers that you could learn something from a kindergarten teacher and vice versa is really hard. But like, there's so many different things that you can cross over. And I, I thought it was brilliant. And I even had an idea to take it further. Of course, I used to teach writing and I'm like, well, what if they took their own maps and turned that into a story so that they would have to program it and then write the story of where they were going, talk about the terrain and the setting and all of those things. So I think it could just keep going and be very cross-curricular as well. I loved it. Yeah, perfect. And our, um, our little prep, so our five-year-olds actually um, dress them up as the three little pigs and then they code them and tell the little story and they film it. And so, yeah, there's, you know, the storytelling in the junior can easily be adapted for high school as well. You just have to be creative in the way you use them. So that's enough from me, I think. So we'll move, we'll move on now. Um, next, we've got Kathy. So Kathy, when you're ready, let me know and I will start the timer. I think you're muted at the moment. Yeah, let me get set up here. I'm gonna share my screen. Here I am. Perfect. So that looking all right now? Yep. Okay, ready, set, go. This is a little bit insane. There's no way that this is going to fit in four minutes. I'm just going to put that out the front. I mean, even my title isn't going to fit in four minutes. Um, essentially, I want to talk today about learning experiences that, that leverage shapes. And I'm not going to target any particular year levels here. I'm just going to float this idea for you and see what you throw back at me. Um, and because there's so much stuff stuffed into this little presentation, just know that at this link at the end, you'll be able to find all the app names and um, resources to go ahead and, and to have some big old fun with this. I'm focusing on one particular app called Assembly. Um, you'll be able to use this across different platforms, but there's a bunch of other apps that would sit really nicely with this kind of idea as well. So those will be there for you at the end. Essentially with this app, um, assembly, what you've got is a whole variety of shapes that you can put together and you can put them on top of each other, you can change colours, sizes, scale, all of that sort of thing. The interface is a really, really easy to use interface, so I'm talking um, elementary can handle this app for sure and some of my year 12 students have um, done amazing things with it. Things like designing emojis, which is so, so fun. Um, different buttons and little pieces for games can be created in here, but full-blown artworks as well. Um, the sky's the limit. Here we are essentially putting together a fashion show and having a timed competition um, with some designs, which was a lot of fun. Just as a side, when I show people what we're doing, I always like to put some little notes about the learning experiences that have been happening while we've gone about producing the images, because they're beautifully visual at the end and it's lovely to share those, but actually unpacking what the students were learning while they've been engaged with art, arts learning experiences, I think is really important too. Um, I wanna show you this little clip of one of my students using assembly app here, because this is really important. You can sketch out um, or use a whole variety of different tools to produce um, designs for things. But the reason why I choose this tool um, for some students and some experiences is because as you can sort of see as this clip runs through, it's a very iterative approach that we have um, when we use a, a, a digital tool like this in that the students can push forward and back and they can delete and, and cut and paste to their heart's content. And if you followed along with that little video clip, and I might even just play it again for you, um, you see the variety of things that they explored during a really, really short time. This is obviously sped up, but you can see that as they're trying to design a logo here for a food product, they've really engaged with a whole bunch of different options. And I'm not sure that that would have happened if, if particularly for this little guy, if he had have had a pen and pencil for this one. So different tools for different kinds of experiences, I think are really, really important. You can see the nice outcome there. Um, one kind of extension on this, because people who know my work know that I love to take digital tools into hands-on spaces as well and use real materials and, and things that they can get really messy with. Um, these are some mandalas that my students designed using this app. Um, and you can see here, this one 
is coming to life. Here we go, there's the different shapes that they've used. This one is coming to life on the screen and then we took it to the laser cutter that we're fortunate to have at my school and we actually cut the pieces out to create these beautiful um, kind of designs in three dimensions. They were put together by the students as one light minute. and they then dropped candles into those. So these beautiful pieces that evolved in app um, really turned into something pretty special. But just to float some of those other ideas, um, uh, you know, of kind of working out of the devices as well, you could take designs that you've created into um, sculptural pieces like these students are doing here as they're building out those particular mandelas with real objects. That's pretty exciting watching those evolve. Um, and those other sort of apps that I thought would sit really nicely with these sorts of ideas as you explore geometry and the things that you can create with layers and shapes. There's an app called 3D Shapes um, which lets you unpack um, different kinds of um, forms and shapes um, and, and do beautiful things there. With Foldify, you can actually print out nets of different forms and you can decorate those and use those to do all kinds of mathematical thinking that gets very creative. Um, iOrnament allows you to create tessellations with shapes. So does Amazeograph. And the last one is, of course, using something like Tangram. So you can really see um, that there's some beautiful connections to bigger lessons there if you're after those. Thanks, everybody. That was a lot in four, wasn't it? That was a lot. <laughs> well done, Kathy. I know it's always hard. And, you know, I think also for me then with my child, I was like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe four minutes is already out. Um, but what is great there is you've taken things and ideas that teachers will be using in their classroom but also applied it in the art room. And... You know, for me working at an IB PYP school, obviously everything we do is transdisciplinary. And I know our art teacher is always like, oh, I'm stuck now. Like, what do I do now for the next unit? And always having to think. And I think what you've done there is something that she can then apply across every year level. So really thank you for sharing that. And even if we're not art teachers, you know, I've just, you know, the logo thing in assembly, I know that our kids are creating their own companies at the end of the year for another unit that we do. and. I'm just thinking, oh, perfect, in Tinker Time, I can link that in and then they can make a logo to go with their company that they create. So thank you for sharing that. I love bringing artistic things. You can probably see from my wall behind me, our contraction caterpillars, but I'm always looking at interesting things to bring into the classroom to bring a bit more life and excitement and creativity in. So thank you. Any other questions, comments? I just have a real quick one. As someone who cannot even draw stick figures, um, don't say that. Don't that, say that. And sometimes I get worried that like my kids catch that off me as well. But I've got some really great artists in here. So I guess my question is, um, because you can sort of undo and delete and go really quickly, do you find that that helps um, helps to keep the students who maybe don't see themselves as great artists engaged um, using that type of app? I love this question, Matt, and it's one that I, I talk about a lot because uh, as a person who um, you know, believes 100% that yes, you can draw a stick figure. Um, it's just whether or not you want to put in the time and the practice and the effort into that area. Um, it's something that that's very close to my heart. I, I think we've got to be really careful when we talk about creativity, that we honour all kinds of different um, creative outputs. And so giving students opportunities to use a whole variety of tools is very important. Um, fascinatingly, I find um, students can behave um, it really differently across mediums. Um, and that absolutely there are for some students huge barriers to entry if they've got a pencil or, or paint in their hands. And they, they may find that sometimes with digital tools that the ability for things to be in progress constantly um, under attack from the undo button and the delete is, is a wonderful thing. Other students love digging into something where every mark is permanent. So I would say that it's allowing opportunities across materials and mediums um, for students and, and kind of honouring that difference. Um, that's important and knowing that sometimes one tool will lead to another is very powerful as well. So when students find that they've got um, more of an ability to risk take on a digital device, they may actually then come back to painting. But if we stick with the things that they struggle with, we may find that, um, you know, if the barriers at, at A, B and C, that they may never get to X, Y and Z when they're actually very, very capable of producing um, rotoscoping, even though they may think that they can't render a, a face that looks real. So opportunities across mediums, across tools are really, really important. Perfect. Thank you. Did anyone else have any comments? Oh, uh, Kathy, I look at your work all the time and I just want to be in your classroom. It's so good. Oh. 
Do you know what I love the most is for somebody, you know, like Matt and myself probably would, oh, you can't draw, but it's actually what you're doing by showing the journey is showing that the end piece is not actually the, the result of just one attempt. It's a, uh, mm-hmm. an attempt, many attempts and it's iterations and it's deleting and undoing. And by celebrating that, what you're actually showing is that don't look at the glossy finish for everybody, creativity can be a struggle and that struggle is actually the reward in it. So yeah, I'm signing up your class. Oh, thank you. I think the the two words that I, I talk about a lot are process and product. Both are important at different times, but if we look at, um, you know, a process as a journey towards a product, we're probably missing the fact that actually there was 50 different times we could have speared off into something pretty darn amazing. So um, allowing for that, that, um, that friction, but also those opportunities is, is vital. So thank you for saying that. That means a lot. And thank you, Kathy. I know that you inspired me in your Ignite talk. So I have to get you on the show and I'm so glad we did because everything you're saying can be just transferred across everything. And last but not least today, we have got Casey Bell. And I know Casey's going to be sharing um, Google Keep, which is a favourite tool of mine. And I've actually just got the teacher I work with onto it. So we now have shared sticky notes. And it's funny, we were actually, I won't say, actually, I'll tell, say it at the end. I'm not going to spoil your thing, Casey. Um, so let me know when you're ready and we can start the timer. Okay, can I say something really quick? First of all, Kathy loved it, loved it hard. I was downloading Assembly as as you were talking about it. And because I am also, and you will see in part of my presentation, I am not the pen to paper drawing, but I love graphic art. So that was, that was really cool. And so hearing you say that out loud also gives me some hope, but um, this is actually my presentation from ISTE. It's a 20 minute presentation that I'm going to try to do in four minutes. So um, I was also kind of happy that other people went over. So I'm just saying that mostly because I just want to give the link so that everybody has everything, whether I get to talk about it or not. So, um, so I am going to share and then I will be ready here. Perfect. And don't worry. I sometimes do an hour long presentation in four minutes. Okay. <laughs> yes. So um So we good? Everybody can see it? Perfect. All right. So here's the link. I created a special page just for um, today's presentation. So shakeup.link forward slash TTP 32. And um, it will remain there for uh, forever as long as I have access to do that. So I am going to talk about Google Keep. And it is one of my favorite tools. I'm a little obsessed as of late. It is officially now part of G Suite for Education. Um, By the way, there is a slide with all of my contact information as well. Um, But if you haven't used Google Keep, it really is a great way to organize, share notes, lists, reminders, and they keep adding these really cool, robust tools, the ability to add images, to draw, to add voice notes. And um, it's just just a really fun fun way um, to help stay organized and to help students in several different ways. So Um, Here's just a quick kind of screenshot of what it could look like in terms of the color, the images, the size, and you can click and drag and move things around. So um, I also created a nine page downloadable cheat sheet for Google Keep. So you can um, follow the link and go get that for free from my website as well. Um, But if you're interested, get Google Keep for everything. So there is the mobile app, there are um, Chrome apps, there's an extension, and and that's going to help you use it across all of your devices. And it's very easy to create a note. I mean, you just start typing and then you'll see all these little icons to add additional information. So um, you can add reminders, including location-based reminders. Um, Of course, you can add those collaborators because it is Google that we're talking about, right? Um, You can change the note colors. So depending on how you like to work, you can sort of color code your notes as you as you like. And then you have the ability to add images. And this really just opens up all kinds of doors for the ways that we may use these um, Google Keep notes and lists and things like that. So um, you can snap a photo from your phone or upload your own. Here is a quick screenshot of a way I thought about students using um, images inside Google Keep. So first of all, I think the visual piece of it helps students stay organized a little bit better. I created these 
in Canva, C-A-N-V-A.com. And this was like the Instagram little template. So I just took a simple template, changed the image, changed the name. And so I'm just thinking through different students, and this is a secondary example, but you know, students who change class periods and being able to sort of learn that time management thing that my students really struggled with. Um, of course, you know, keeping track of their notes and research and things like that is great as well, but there's a full blog post on how to do this as well. Um, so when you go to add a drawing, which I think this is one of the coolest parts, you can go to the three dots and click on add a drawing and it gives you this whiteboard. And so, um, so you can draw, your students can draw, you can sketch, um, you can take notes, you can do all kinds of things. So you've got like one markers, minute. pencils. Are you still there? Yeah, one minute. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, I'm talking. Okay. Okay. I got it. Um, so I don't know how many of you are familiar with the new Chromebooks that are coming out. So when it comes to the drawing idea, the new Chromebooks, the flip Chromebooks that are coming with the stylus sort of open up some new doors and we're sort of bridging the gap between the traditional laptop and tablet. So, um, like I said, my hand drawing skills, not so great, but I did a little app smash and I used Google's auto draw to sort of overcome some of that and to get some of these symbols. So watch my terrible sketch here of a laptop. And then auto draw automatically figured out what I was trying to draw so I could then put that into my notes. This is also an example of the sketch that was created during my presentation of this at ISTE that I just wanted to share because I think it's amazing. And another example of the way that we could use uh, sketch notes and drawing. Um, of course, we've also got Google Docs integration. If you just go to tools, your keep notepad, you can bring things in from Google Docs. So for instance, since I can add images into keep, that means I could have badges put into my Google Keep and I could add badges to students work directly into Google Docs. So um, Stephanie Filardo also did this with some Docs stickers, like good job, sort of that traditional kind of thing. But um, so tons of different ways that you can click and drag and sort of merge Google Keep with Google Docs. Um, of course, you can also do voice notes from mobile and it will dictate, it will translate it into your note, which is super awesome. All right, this is an infographic, 15 ways for students to use Google Keep. Of course, I know I don't have time to go over all of these, but if you're just thinking out loud, oh, how can my students use this in, in our class? Here is a, a link to a blog post with even more details on how to do this. Get the Chrome extension so that you can bookmark and, and take some notes there. And we also had a podcast episode on Google Keep, so I linked that as on there as well. All right, I did it. Okay, am I done? <laughs> yeah, perfect. If you just stop screen sharing, then it okay. Be <laughs> it's always a fun thing at the end. Perfect. And I, you know, the thing the thing with Google Keep is, you know, not only for students but even teachers. Like the teacher I work with, we were finding that this is what I was going to say before. We were just finding that some days, you know, especially towards the end of the week, things we hadn't got done, we were just jotting them down. She was just jotting it down on a, a little sticky note. And then she was away one day and I've gone, where is that sticky note? And I said, I need to get you onto Google Keep. And so now everything, any notes we take, it's on Google Keep. We know where it is. We share it with each other. And another teacher of mine shares her Google Keep notes with her husband. So any kid reminders, then he's got them. And another great thing, this isn't a school related, but you can make grocery lists. And so when you go to the supermarket, when you put the location, it buzzes your phone. So if you forget, like I always do at the end of the day, like me too. to get milk or something, um, my phone reminds me in Google Keep. So I think it's very versatile. And in this busy world, we need something to just help us. And having it digital just really is awesome so thank you and there were some cool little tips there with the images that kids can drag into google docs i didn't know you could do that so did you know that it will also read the text on the images oh. it'll pull the text from the so like the sticky notes even if you're still writing on a sticky note snap a picture of it yeah. and then when you put it in there you can actually i think you right click on it and it will pull the text if it can read it from the image so that's cool too even for the and people who sort of want both yeah, and I know if you've got a Surface, you can write with your Surface in the notes as well. So um, if you haven't got the Chromebook writing pen stylus one yet. Any other comments or questions? I have a comment. I, isn't technology amazing? You look at, there's just some really clever people doing some really clever things because for, <coughs> excuse me, 
for digital badges, like to be able to, to drag that in and to, to start to build a bit of a portfolio of skills is phenomenal. But for like, I look at, at my staff and some of them, you know, it's, I want my pen, I'm, I'm glued to my pen, but I always lose my sticky notes. So what you're doing is sort of traversing both worlds and allowing them to, to, you know, to develop their own habits. So it's just an amazing, Google Keep is just amazing. And now I've got an even better idea. They can create logos using assembly, drop it into Google Keep and then drop it into documents. Look at that. Yes. That's like a fat smash of Teach Tech Play episode 32 there. <laughs> Love I don't it. know about you guys either, but like sticky notes are getting like less sticky, I think. So I'm scribbling on things and sticking them places and they're not staying. So I'm a, I'm a Google keeper. I love it. And at the moment, there's lots of conversations happening um, in our year six class about organization for high school and they write things down and they never know. So tomorrow morning, Google keeps going on their devices and we're going to start playing. It's so fun. Thanks so much. Perfect. Well, that actually takes us to the end of episode 32, which always makes me sad at the end. But I must say it was a great lineup of presenters, some fantastic tools that have been shared. And even not just this episode, if this is the first episode that you are joining us, make sure you go back onto our website, teachtechplay.com forward slash web show, and you can go watch every single episode we've ever recorded. And I know even myself, I sort of went back and looked at a couple and I was like, oh, I forgot about that. And oh yeah, you can do that. And there are so many great things up there. So make sure you go back, have a look and reach out to these guys. I, that's how Teach Tech Play really started is, you know, I sort of had an idea. I wanted to continue to learn. I just reached out to people. So make sure you do that too. Reach out to these guys if you've got questions, comments. If you're not sure, if you have got a question or comment, use the Teach Tech Play hashtag, TT Play, and we will help get you in contact with someone. A lot of the time I don't know the answers, but I'm sure I can find someone who does know the answers. So um, join our community and um, we'd love to see other people. I'm pretty sure next month's episode is going to be a special one. Um, there's been a bit of banter going on on Twitter, if anyone has seen since ISTE with some of the UK people. So I'm still lining it up, but it should be a UK special next month of Teach Tech Play. I've just got to confirm that. Um, but it should be fun with the boys from the UK. Um, there's been quite a lot of banter, I must say, since ISTE and meeting them in person. So uh, keep an eye out for that episode next month um, and just reach out and keep sharing and doing everything that you're doing um, and thank you to our wonderful presenters. See you guys.